Um, so thank you for coming along to the session, um, to the uh, day three of, of ELC. My name's Chris Chaplin. Um, I work for a company that, um, until very recently, has been called Altera. Um, we're now in a, a stage of being called Altera, now part of Intel. Um, and soon it'll be the Intel Programmable Solutions Group. Um, so we were acquired in, in December by Intel, and we're very excited about some of the, the opportunities that that's going to bring us um, as both companies. So I'm an embedded technology specialist. Um, so what that means is that I, um, I'm in a sales role, but very technical. Um, and I look after accounts in the UK and Scandinavia. Now I spend about half of my time in, time in a sales role and the other half of my time helping customers on site with uh, more deep technical issues, specifically related to embedded processes. So every time that someone's got a problem, um, we get a call um, and then quite often I'll, I'll go out on site and, and help them resolve that. And it's, it's through doing that that I've learned some, some of the techniques um, that we can use to help uh, debug these kind of systems. Um, and I'm hopefully going to share with you something very generic. Uh, it doesn't have to be used with um, our devices. It can be used um, across the, the industry. And hopefully something very simple but very um, effective at helping debug issues where you have both um, a processor and some programmable logic, um, either in the same device or on the same board. Oops. To start off, does anyone recognize this PCB at all? Yeah. Sinclair ZX Spectrum, yeah, 48K. And I recognize this board a lot because I probably spent as much time with the case off, you know, having a play with things as, as with the case on. Now, I wanted to start off with a picture of this particular device because it's quite synonymous with how we've gone to um, in, the, in the coming years. This, this device was made in the, the early 1980s. I think this is a, um, a Rev 2 or 3 ball, 1983 or thereabouts. And one thing that you'll notice is that everything's discrete. So we've got a CPU on here, the good old Z80. Um, and this device, um, you know, for its time, was very powerful, um, but still low cost enough to make a, a consumer product. And the good thing about this kind of device, if you're looking to do some debug, I can see a thousand places that I can do some debug. So if I wanted to look between the CPU and the ROM, I could get out an oscilloscope probe. I can put it on any net that I want to, uh, because everything is just wired up. It's pretty much a, a dual layer board as well, so we can just literally get to any signal that we want to get to. So very, very easy in order to debug. But let's look a bit more about the ZX Spectrum just to see what it had on the board. So it had 48 kilobytes of RAM, you know, a reasonable amount for the time, broken into two banks, a 16K bank and a 32K bank. Interestingly, that 32K set of eight RAMs, they're actually 64 kilobit RAMs but the yield was so low on these devices that they used to mark them as either the top working or the bottom working. Uh, depending on whether the top or the bottom worked, you'd strap some pins at the very top of this board, um, up the top here to specify you know, which dud devices you were using. Um, so a great way of improving yield. Then we had a Ferranti gate array. So this was uh, called a, a ULA or an uncommitted logic array. And this was a set of logic features um, that a, a designer could use and then they get the final metal layer um, created and fabricated. So it's kind of like a one-time programmable device in a way. You'd get it fabricated, um, but you'd use one of these Ferranti devices uh, to get all of the rest of your logic in the system. And finally, the old 74 series devices, we had some um, glue logic as well. I think this is the last time I've actually seen a slide with a piece of, um, with a semiconductor saying the word England on it. So it's always uh, good to see. And now we take a look at something uh, a bit more up to date. So this is um, an FPGA device with an embedded processor in there. Um, it's a, a very small form factor board. This is a, a system on module style board. And guess what? Everything is under that one same device. So we've got um, CPU, could be a dual core, uh, Cortex-A9, A53s um, are in the market now as well. The ROM, the RAM, the gate array, the glue logic. Everything is under this one amorphous blob of plastic. So there's no way to, to get your scope out. Um, it's even pretty much impossible to get to the ball grid array that uh, this device is at. So we have to learn and use different techniques in order to debug these things. We still have the RAM um, on chip. You can see those two DDR devices down the bottom there. 
But again, you'd need specialised equipment in order to be able to see how these work, to be able to debug them. And even putting a probe on something will change its behaviour, which is always fun. And as well, um, with these devices, we have groups of different people working on the same physical device and the same design. Now, of course, we're at the Linux conference, so we have the embedded Linux, or DOS in this case, um, uh, software engineer. And they'll be working on code to do with the application, uh, to do with the operating system running on these devices. But because we have a programmable device and a lot of the code is going to be uh, custom in there, we also have the hardware engineer. <laughs> and these two people have got to be working together on this. So software and hardware have got to come together, um, especially in these integrated devices. It's not so much possible just to throw a bit of code over a wall and just agree on an address map. Things can be changing all the time. Um, that's the power of these configurable devices. Um, and so we have to work a lot more tightly together. I've been into customers where I've been introducing the hardware and the software engineers together, and it's the first time, sometimes seriously, that they've actually been in the same room and been talking to each other, uh, working on the same project. So the problem that we're trying to address and work out ways of resolving is that systems are getting far more complex. Yeah, we've just brought out a device that's got six million logic elements, just the logic elements, let alone the, the processors as well. And we're doing far more on one chip. It's quite possible that you'll see a device that just has one device in the system and then the power supplies and, and logic around there and, and memory. And the debug itself is getting more challenging. And it's getting challenging for a couple of reasons. So the first reason it's getting challenging is, as I've mentioned, everything's in one device. So there's limited opportunity to, to get in there and start to scope things around. But also because these devices are becoming more and more programmable, things keep changing. So it could well be that you're writing software and hardware at the same time, and the hardware's being upgraded at the same time the software's being upgraded. It's not a level playing field. It's not a, a known entity anymore. And guess what? The hardware can have bugs in it as well, um, especially if you're developing, or the hardware engineer are developing their own IP. So there's really a question about how do we narrow down the scope of where the issue is? Is it a software bug? Is it a hardware bug? Is it both? And how do we determine which engineer can go home and which one has to stay late? But seriously, these kind of bugs, and as I say, I, I cover uh, Northern Europe, and I see a lot of customers, both big customers with lots of resources, and also small customers that are quite small and just starting up. And chasing these kind of bugs can be soul-destroying and can also cause companies to go under. So I was working with a customer a few years ago. They'd already spent over six weeks trying to chase a bug. They didn't know where it was. They didn't know if it was in software or in hardware. But they needed to meet a deadline in a few days' time to get their next round of venture capital funding. If they couldn't show a prototype that was working, they couldn't pay their staff anymore. It was literally the case of life or death for that company based on debugging one of these issues. Fortunately, we found the issue and, and, and we fixed it. And we're going to be using the methods I'm going to be showing you. But the idea is, if you plan ahead of time, if you're at the stage where you're just starting a project and you're able to influence the, the hardware design, influence the PCB design, just with a few signals, it can make a lot of difference into how you can debug these kinds of systems. Now, obviously, most of the people um, in the room, I'd imagine, would be software engineers. How many people would describe themselves as a software engineer in the room? Yeah, pretty much everyone in the room. So we're probably more familiar with the, the software debug tools. So obviously we have GDB, KGDB, those kind of tools for um, either directly on the host or via Ethernet to be able to single step through application code, uh, maybe do some kernel debugging as well. And then when you want to get down to the very low level debugging, you'll have a JTAG style debugger, something like um, a Lauterbach or a, an ARM D-Stream, or uh, there's a variety of, of third parties that you can use for debugging. And that will allow you to, to stop the processor, single step through the code, dump the registers, realize why something's crashed, um, upload new code, and so on. But also on the hardware side with programmable logic, we also have uh, debug uh, engines as well. So Altera, now part of Intel, has a tool called SignalTap. Xilinx have got a tool called Chipscope Pro. And these tools allow you to have a look at an arbitrary signal or set of signals or buses in, in an FPGA and actually have what looks like a, a desktop logic analyzer. So you can set things up, make a, a special test implementation of the design, and then you can set trigger points to say, 
okay, I want to have a look at this particular chip enable, and I want to trigger when that chip enable occurs, and then have a look at what bus transactions were happening, or what arbitrary signals were happening around the design. So if we look at um, a PCB, there's, there's kind of two use cases that I'm uh, giving examples of here. The first use case is if we've got a discrete processor, maybe you've got an ARM or an Intel processor or something sat on a PCB, and then you've got some kind of programmable logic. And as I say, it doesn't matter you know, what, which vendor it is or what kind of logic it is. Now what you kind of find is that quite often uh, the CPU will have um, a set of debug and trace signals that could be exposed to pins on the device. And one of those signals could be called many different things. It could be halted or stop or break. Um, you'll tend to have a signal that will indicate that a hardware breakpoint has been hit, um, the process has stopped, um, and the processor isn't running at the moment. It's kind of in a, a debug or halted state. And you'll tend to find that on most processors will have that kind of interface. And there's also another pin that you could uh, potentially expose. Um, again, it could have a, a number of different names, but the idea behind this signal is that it's an external break. So this signal, if a debugger probe was to, to toggle that signal high, that would stop the processor. So it's like a, the equivalent of an external breakpoint that you could stop the processor on. If we then look at that logic analyzer that I was talking about before, as well as having all the different signals that you can hook up on that logic analyzer, you'll also quite often have a trigger input port and a trigger output port. So the trigger input port, if I toggle that high and the logic analyzer is looking for that signal, it will start acquiring bus transactions around that point. The trigger out, if bus transactions that you're looking at have occurred, that trigger output signal will go high. So what happens if we hook these sets of signals together? So what I've done here is very simple, and you can imagine on a PCB, this is just two traces. I've hooked the halted line from the CPU up to the trigger input line on the logic analyzer, and I've hooked up the trigger output signal from the uh, logic analyzer to the external break input of the processor. And these are programmable, so um, both the FPGA and the processor side, I could choose to ignore those signals or enable them, but they're there on the hardware. What I can then do is I can set a software breakpoint after a particular line of code that I'm interested in, and then see what's happening at the FPGA at exactly that moment in time. Also, if I look at a particular bus transaction in the, in the logic, maybe I've got a bus error or an exception, that could cause a trigger output that stops the processor, and I can see exactly what code was running at that moment in time. Two signals, that's all I'm asking for. Hopefully we can fit them on the PCB. Now if we were to have an Altera SOC FPGA, a Xilinx Zinc device, um, something similar to that, you'll notice that the processor and the logic analyzer and the FPGA, they're all in the same package. But these signals still exist. So you can hook these up um, within the design. Uh, you don't have to think about it at PCB layout time, but these signals can exist and we can use them for exactly the same process. Now stepping into the ARM ecosystem a bit, and we've had a couple of presentations this week on, um, on the, the ARM debug infrastructure and, and how that's supported under Linux. We have these things called CTIs or cross-triggering interfaces. Um, a cross-triggering interface is a way of being able to hit a breakpoint, for example, or a watch point on one CPU, and then in a very programmatic way, we can stop the other CPU, or maybe not. So Cortex-A9s, this is a dual core system here, like we have in some of our devices. You could be running SMP Linux and running that, those on both cores, in which case, if you hit a, a breakpoint on one, more than likely, you probably want to stop both cores at that point to see exactly what the status of both cores were. If one of them was running your entertainment system and the other one was running the airbag system, you probably don't want to hit a breakpoint on the entertainment system and stop your airbags working. So it is possible to, to break that link programmatically with these uh, cross-triggering interfaces such that a breakpoint only affects one of the CPUs. Then at the top, we've got something called a CTM, a cross-triggering multiplexer. And what this allows us to do is communicate cross-triggering information between clusters of Cortex-A9s, for example. So ARM would define a cluster of anything up to, to four um, processors, and then you could have multiple clusters in, in an ASIC, for example. The CTM allows you to effectively daisy-chain that cross-triggering interface between clusters of devices. So what we've got as an example, um, if you have a look at the, the bottom of this diagram here, we have a cross-triggering interface going out to the FPGA. So what this means is that the FPGA gains access to those signals for the, the 
debug stopped and the trigger input ports such that we can actually affect the CPUs with that information in a very programmable way. So how does this all fit together? So as I mentioned, hardware and software can now start just using these simple interfaces to cooperate together within a debug environment. So I could have a, a Lauterbach or a, an ARMD stream, some kind of JTAG interface on, the, on the, uh, the processor side. The hardware engineer could have a, an FPGA logic analyzer on the, on the, the hardware side, uh, JTAG debug on the, the software side. And they, those two can cooperate with each other and we can work together hardware and software engineer to, to code debug a problem. Work out where, where it is, then one of them can go home. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to demonstrate um, a very simple demonstration um, just to, to give you an idea about how this kind of interface can work. So I've called this um, a code debugging uh, demonstration. I'm just gonna go through um, the, the setup of this. It's a live demo, so what could possibly go wrong? So down the bottom here, I've got a, um, a, a demonstration board that's got a, um, an SOC device on there. Um, this is one of our boards, uh, an Atlas board. And that board's got an Arduino header on, uh, as well as some other GPIOs. So I've gone to Adafruit, uh, grabbed an Arduino header, and I've got this NFC um, RFID shield, um, so I can yeah, read contactless cards with that. In addition, I've got this, um, this blue and red um, siren on here, so I've got some kind of a sounder connected to a relay board that I'm also connecting to the system. Now, the idea behind this particular demonstration, we've got a biscuit drawer in the office. So we've got a sales office, and, and behind Betty's desk, we've got a drawer full of biscuits. And those are sales biscuits. Those biscuits belong to sales. My colleague here is in support. These aren't his biscuits. <laughs> These are sales biscuits. So the idea is, if I get my Altera badge and I tap into this system, the biscuit drawer will open, everything will be fine. If Chris tries to get into the biscuit drawer, all hell will break loose. We'll get a very clear visual indication and a very clear audible indication uh, that someone's trying to nick Betty's biscuits. So as far as the architecture of this system is concerned, um, I've added a few uh, logic blocks to the system. So down the bottom here, I've got a CPU system. This is a standard processor system as we and some of our competitors use. Dual core Cortex-A9 in this case, lots of dedicated peripherals, um, DDR controller. All of that is hardened logic. It's tested. We know uh, how it works. All the Linux BSP has been generated for that. That's all good. We then have some bridges. Um, they don't actually quite connect up to the other bus. They should be a bit higher than that. And that connects into the programmable logic. In the programmable logic, we can have multiple other peripherals. And in my case, I've got something called an alarm driver, um, which is my custom peripheral that, as a hardware engineer, I've developed. Now, we're going to test this design, and we're going to find that this design doesn't actually work. Um, I'm going to tap in. Chris will tap in. We'll see what happens. Maybe there's going to be a bug in there somewhere. What we're going to do is we're going to grab the logic analyzer and we're going to start having a look at the signals around this custom peripheral. The idea is, if I've written a Linux device driver for this particular peripheral, as a software engineer, my thought is, if I've followed the agreement, agreed specification in our joint documentation, if I'm writing to the correct address, the correct piece of data, and if the hardware guy's logic analyzer can see that bit of data on the bus, then all my, hard, all my software is working correctly. I think that's a fair assumption? Good. I think so too. If I don't see a bus transaction on there, it's probably a hardware fault as well, but we'll look a bit further into that. Maybe it's a bridge or something else that hasn't been, been done. But my, my get home quickly card is that I, if I can see an Avalon standard bus transaction setting that alarm signal high at the right moment in time, it's not a software issue. So that's the setup we're going to use. So I'm just going to start off this uh, system. Um, and as I mentioned, we're going to be using a software debugger, a hardware debugger, and a console um, all on the projector. Fortunately, this uh, projector isn't quite as, um, uh, as small as some of the other ones. So let's see if we can get things running. I'm going to start off by. Um, opening a, a command prompt. 
I'm going to be launching um, an Eclipse debugger. In my case, I'm using ARM DS5, but you could be using other debuggers. Um, as I say, these mechanisms are um, in the hardware, so we can use pretty much uh, any tool that we want. There's lots of um, low-cost third-party tools that you can use as well. So I've started the debugger, and I'll just show you my uh, configuration for this before we get going. So usually I'd have a, a, a big debug probe. It just so happens on this board we can use a, the programming cable to also act as the debugger, so it's a lot more compact for, for this example as a demo. And I'm going to be um, running a, a kernel-aware debug session um, as an SMP system over both uh, CPUs. I've got some options here for, for the, um, the debug and trace services. Um, so the first tab here is the um, enabling the interface between the CPU and the FPGA. So if you've got a discrete CPU, you probably won't need to do that stage. Um, you can just gain access to the debug signals. If you've got a combined um, CPU FPGA, those interfaces need to be enabled for that cross-triggering multiplexer uh, in order to work. I've also connected up Trace. We're using the embedded Trace router. Some of my colleagues call it an embedded Trace router, but I remind them that ARM is English, so it's an embedded Trace router. And we're going to connect that up to some on-chip memory uh, in the system. I'm not going to be really using Trace in this uh, example too much. And then we enable trace and, and debug for both of the CPUs. So it's quite a simple setup, not, not too much going on. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, start my um, uh, RS-232 and um, get from U-boot and start getting into the, uh, into the kernel. Ignore the I-squared C errors that come up. That didn't come up that time, that's good. Okay. So I've got my example here and I've got my um, access control um, bit of software that's running. So this is polling the, um, the NFC card over an SPI interface. I've uh, ported the NFC tools over to, to this target. Um, quite a simple demonstration. And I can, for example, take my um, ID badge and you know, pop it on there and, yep, the door's open. I can open the biscuit cupboard, um, get everything out of there. So maybe now's a good time to check to see um, how the system's running. Um, so Chris, can you come along and try and open the biscuit cupboard? This is Chris. I'll look away. <laughs> Betty would have normally stopped him by now. So we've got our intruder alert. So that's good. So we can see that the um, NFC subsystem is working. We can read the card. We realize it's Chris. We know that he shouldn't have biscuits. But the alarm didn't go off. Okay, so there's definitely some kind of problem. I know it's not in the SPI side of things with NFC. It must be something to do with the alarm device driver, the alarm hardware, the FPGA, something along those lines. So let's start our debug session. So as I say, I'm connecting over a, a USB programming cable um, just for compactness. So this is a bit slower than if you use a, a dedicated bit of um, uh, debug hardware. So I've connected to the board. Um, this has stopped the processors, and I can see that it's kernel aware. I can see all the, um, the active threads and, and what else is running in the system. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the part of the device driver for my alarm driver uh, that actually writes out to the, uh, the relay that controls the siren. So if I look in the functions over here, um, there should be a function uh, called um, siren GPIO set. And that's the, that's the last bit of the device driver that runs before I actually um, toggle this relay. So if I have a look at the source code for this, here's my bit of source code for the device driver. And down the bottom here, there's this line write L, which is the, the write out to the, the, the relay. So I'm going to set a breakpoint not on that line, but the line after it. So what I want to do is I want the write transaction to go out, and then I want to signal stop. What happened? Let's have a look at the buses to see what was going on. So we should do the write, or at least send the write out onto the interconnect, and then I want to be able to use this logic analyzer to see what was happening in the hardware. So let me open another terminal window, and we're going to add yet another piece of software onto this example. And that's the, the logic analyzer. So this is called 
quarter signal tap in the case of Altera or Intel. So this is the, the logic analyzer, and I'm not, not going to go into the, too much of the hardware details of this. Um, but what I've done is in this particular example that's configured onto this board, as well as some other signals that I was doing for a genuine debug when I was um, bringing up the system, the NFC wasn't working at first and so on. So I was using this tool, you know, eating our own dog food so, as it was to, to debug this system. I've got a set of signals here which are the local Avalon bus standard signals connected up to my hardware device driver. So I can use this to see when does the chip select go high. If the chip select goes high, we're talking to the address range of this, this controller. Uh, we can see the data values and so on. So let's just finish setting this up. I need to resize this window. I think it was a bit different resolution before. So we'll connect to the board over JTAG um, to the FPGA in the JTAG chain. And we've got a few triggers that we can use. Um, so the trigger that I want to use in this case what is the breakpoint out from the CPU. So the CPU's got a, a hardware breakpoint set. That's going to toggle a signal high. And that's going to be the trigger input to the logic analyzer. So we want to sense that uh, trigger input. So I've got to resize all these windows to get that sorted. But the trigger in over here is connected to the hard processor's trigger out. And I'm interested about a rising edge on that signal. So as soon as that signal transitions high, that's my trigger. And that's where I want to look at. I'll just double check down here. I don't seem to be able to resize these windows on this, dis oh, there we go. On this display. But just make sure that nothing else is, is being looked at. These are all don't cares. So that's fine. So what I'll do is I'll um, get my system up and running. So make sure that that's um, all going. And what we'll do is we'll um, set up the um, set up signal tap to have a look at those uh, those signals. So let's have a look here. So this is looking for a rising edge of that. That's not currently running, so we're going to uh, get the acquisition running on that. So Linux is running, um, and as soon as I get a situation where that um, that alarm is about to be set, then Linux will stop, hit the breakpoint. We'll have a look at the logic analyzer, see what was going on. So Chris, can you try and grab a biscuit again? So we didn't, get, we didn't get as far this time, um, but the right should have happened. If we have a look at the debugger, um, it's connected and the processes are stopped. And we can see that we're in the access control um, on CPU 0 at this stage. Um, so CPU 1 wasn't doing anything useful. Um, it's a pretty lightly loaded system. And we're in this access control executable on, on the other CPU. Let's have a look at signal tap. and see what was going on here. I apologize, it's a bit small on the screen. But we can see that the, the chip select had just gone high when we received that signal. Um, so we can see that a bus transaction coincided with the point when that happened. And if I have a look at the data output port, um, this relay is active low. Um, so writing a zero actually sets off the relay. Um, so in this case, um, that bus transaction was valid. Um, so congratulations, software engineers. You can all go home. This is definitely a, a hardware issue, not a software issue. But what if it wasn't? Um, and let's have a look at the, the other way that we can um, treat this. Um, I'll go on to fixing the issue in a minute. We know it's a, a hardware issue. I just want to show you that connection in the opposite way around. So we can use a trigger in the FPGA in order to stop the processor and to see what was going on. So I'm going to get the, um, the processor back running. I'll get rid of my breakpoint. Um, so effectively, there's, there's no breakpoints in this system now. Um, and we just get this, um, these CPUs are back running, so it's back happy doing its thing. On the hardware side, we're going to um, ignore that trigger in now, but we're going to create a, a different trigger to the system. So this trigger in uh, will set back to don't care. And the trigger output from the logic analyzer back into the CPU is going to be on the, um, the active low right pin going low. So right underscore n means it's active low. And when that signal goes low, that means that a right transaction is happening to the GPIO that controls the relays. So if I get this running, um, this is free running now. Uh, there's no breakpoints in the CPU side. Um, so let's move back to, to DS5. This is 
connected and running. Um, Chris, keeping Chris busy today. You deserve your biscuit at the end of this. So now, magically, the, the debug has stopped. Um, we're starting to receive trace data, and we can see exactly what was um, happening down here. Um, let's have a look at the signal tap window. We can see that this exactly happened on the, the right pin going low. And if it was that we had an erroneous transaction, say the hardware engineer was saying, someone's writing to my bit of hardware at the wrong time, and they're writing dead code to it, and I think it was you. Um, you know, how do they prove that? Well, they proved that by setting a, a hardware trigger point that then stops the CPU, and we can have a look at the, the debugger to see what was running at the time when that event occurred. So in my case, this access control was running, um, and then we can see from that, we can unravel the stack and so on, and just see exactly what bit of code was working. Does that make sense? Okay. So finally, um, what I'd like to do is to, to fix the hardware issue. So let's get this all back, um, back to a, a decent state again. Um, so this should be running again. I can just check with my car just to make sure that everything's good. And then what we do is we, we go along to our box of tricks and we find the, uh, the particular issue with the hardware. So we realize that our sounder has got a battery backup and only one of them is in. So hopefully quite a, even for a sales guy, hopefully quite a simple, simple fix to make. This was three pounds, very good value. <laughs> Chris, could you try and um, get a biscuit, please? <laughs> and there we have it. So we've managed to save our system. If Chris did have a debit card to hand, we could um, easily pay for one of these um, biscuits and yeah, that would stop it as well, or we could make sure that someone else that was authorized to do that. So that in a nutshell is, is, is the demo. Let me just um, wrap up with some, um, some other notes and then we can um, open to, to questions. So the integration of processors along with programmable logic, they're getting tighter and tighter all the time. Um, I showed you a very simple demo, but if you think about it, it's, it's pretty powerful. The, the visibility that you can get from being able to hook a, a CPU and a, an FPGA together and then look at arbitrary signals around that can literally save a customer's business, and they have done multiple times. Um, you know, I've, I've worked both, uh, at both FPGA vendors, and I've used these techniques at both, and they, they genuinely do save projects. But integration is getting tighter and tighter. Um, so obviously we've had our, our first and second generation devices, as have other customers in the industry. Um, Stratix 10, one of our devices has just come out, that's Quad A53. We're starting to get Xeons and FPGAs together, you know, all under a, a big metal lid. You know, this integration is getting tighter and tighter, more powerful and more powerful. So as the, as the future goes along, we're going to see more and more of that level of integration, um, and it's going to become more and more uh, important to think up front about how these, uh, these debug connections should work. So really, the one message that I want to, to, to give to you guys when you're um, in the project reviews for your, your next projects, you know, I don't mind which CPU or programmable logic device you're going to use. Well, I do, but for the purpose of this. Um, think about how you're going to debug it. So how are you going to work between hardware and software, and, and what mechanisms are you going to use in order to make sure that um, you can debug when it comes to a stressful situation, you're trying to get a product out the door, and you're trying to get things working. My first recommendation to any customer is make sure that you put a trace port at least on your first board, um, and as well have these style interfaces if you have an external CPU. And then hopefully hardware and software can work together, have um, a, a good debugging experience, um, and be able to, to ensure that these issues get resolved very quickly. So that's pretty much all I had. I'm happy to answer any questions if, if anyone has any questions on this. Great. Okay. Uh, so your demo there was really cool. One thing that got me scared is that if you're in a production environment, halting the CPU or halting your hardware is probably not very desirable. Would there be a way uh, to solve this using uh, your current tool chain and just tracing then getting the data somewhere else, analyzing it later, and then coming up with a solution plan for people to fix it? Or you So certainly you could do things such as watch points, for example. Obviously that's still software intrusive in, in a way, less so. Um, but you could do things such that the logic analyzer itself in this example wasn't stopping any of the hardware. 
It was just sampling a, a window in time. Um, you could create that trigger out and then effectively gate a clock enable and then start single stepping, but we didn't do that in this example. So for software, it was intrusive. The, the trace layer, as you know, if it does back up, then it could start to slow things down, although realistically that might not be the case. Um, but it was pretty non-intrusive. But if you, if you set a watch point or something similar for the, uh, for the CTI to trigger on, um, then the software could continue to run. So I didn't, I didn't bring this up in the, um, in the presentation because it's very Altera specific. Uh, we've got a events bus uh, that goes from the FPGA to the um, debug infrastructure, and that will allow um, up to 28 events to be timestamped by the debug, in, um, debug um, clock domain uh, from external events from the FPGA. So if I, if I connected up the, the trigger output to the event bus as well, my, my funnel with all of my instruction trace will have these events timestamped in line with the bus transactions. Yeah, so if I go back, um, so if, if we look on the, um, so these are the events from the FPGA at the top here going into the, the STM um, here, and that gets timestamps as it goes through the, the rest of the system. Not sure if that answers your question or not. But effectively, we can have timestamping. We've got a cross-clock cross domains. Um, the, the FPGA is not going to be running at the same clock domain as the, as the CPU or the, or the debug infrastructure. Um, but there'll be a loose correlation of a, a few clock cycles difference between the two. Anyone else? Any, any other questions? Okay, well, that's pretty much all I had. I hope that was useful. Um, thanks a lot for coming, and I'll, I'll be around for a bit if there's, if there's any more questions. Okay, thank you.